Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa Aparuta de sangamatasa taura so this afternoon it's a opportunity to reflect on what you're hearing. I have this privilege of giving these reflective reflections on the um, full moon, no moon, and half moon days. So I'd like to emphasize the importance of, of being a witness to experience. So being a witness is not, not being an experiencer, it's witnessing experience. So this is quite important to uh, remember because the ignorance of the world is that we become the experiencers. We experience love, hate, like, dislike, happiness, sorrow, grief, despair, success and failure. And these are all experiences that, that we have in a, in a lifetime. But we take it personally, it's personal because it's what I see, what I hear, what I smell, what I taste, what I touch, whether I like it or don't like it. It's all interpreted in these personal terms. But the Buddha, in his teaching, very clear about being the witness. So we have the Buddha Dhamma Sangha trilogy. So the Buddha is the is the witness of the way it is, the Dhamma. So suddenly these three words become to become more significant than if they're just ceremonial chants. So this relationship of Buddha to Dhamma, it's Buddha that knows Dhamma, not the personality. So as a person, as a personality, uh, we'll never know the Dhamma. We might read all about it, be scholars, have PhDs in Buddhist studies, from impressive universities, but as long as it remains intellectual, you're not really in that re being that Buddha knowing Dhamma in a direct way. So Dhamma is apparent here and now. It's not something mystical and and remote. Where when we see it personally, the way we personally interpret the word Dhamma is is always it's you know real I take refuge in the Dhamma. Do you really know what you're taking refuge in? The absolute truth use words like absolute truth, ultimate reality. But they're just empty words in themselves, you know, taking it make it sound very remote. The absolute reality sounds something way out there rather than here and now. So this is the problem of religion. In Christianity, God becomes somebody way out there. And uh, the, the deities of, that, we, that people worship are higher or better or somehow, somehow in a distance, not here and now, where the Dhamma is uh, here and now. 
It's timeless. Ehi Pasiko, come and see for yourself. And so you're not looking outward for Dhamma. You're not trying, you know, what you read in a text, in a scripture, in a sutta is all very good, but that's not the real Dhamma. That's just pointing to Dhamma and trying to uh, make it something uh, kind of realizable. Absolute reality. How do you take refuge in absolute reality? Or ultimate reality. These are superlatives, words in English. Where Buddha and Dhamma, Buddha is ability that we have through awareness. Bhutto being the awakened one here and now, knowing the way it is. All that is arises, ceases, all that begins, ends. So we need this constant reminder of this because we forget we're very, you know, the, the material world that we experience seems very real for us. What is real is uh, we suffer pain, we, we have to live with other people, we feel irritated, we feel when they pass away, then we feel grief. When, uh, when we're successful, we have moments of joy and happiness. So this is all very personal. How successful do you see yourself? How can you sustain a, a, an image of being a very successful monk or nun in, in, as, a, as an ideal? Because the, the human condition that we're experiencing is not an ideal. It's never going to be perfect. So as a person, you know, it's a created personality. Your personality is a created thing. And it can change according to conditions that we have to experience through a lifetime. So in life at Amravati, whatever happens is an experience. So we experience through the senses, through what we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, and think, our reactions to life, the way we're conditioned to love or hate, like or dislike or approve or disapprove. This still happens, but the relationship to the world is through clinging, and that creates a sense of suffering because the world is a realm of suffering in itself. It's going to change. You're not going to find permanent happiness through, world, through uh, organizing the world into a peaceful place, because the world is not, by nature, a very peaceful place. It's in this process of change. The whole solar system, the sun, moon, and stars, Everything is changing. That's its nature. And one's own body is changing. You know, you can't maintain youth. Growing old is part of the human experience. So this is this a sense of being the witness, the puto. Puto is, as I've said many times, a, a helpful word. It's a Buddhist name in a kind of mantra form. And it is the awakened awareness here and now. So just reminding yourself, just at first, one has to use puto as a kind of mantra, a chant. Because it is, you know, it's something that we, we learn, we learn the word. Those of us who were not born into Buddhist 
families or Buddhist societies. We, you know, it's a foreign word in a in the English language. But it's a useful word in terms of its practical use. It's two syllables, and then it means awareness, witnessing the experience that we have. So ask yourself, really ask yourself seriously, what is, what is permanent in your life? What is, what is unchanging from when you were an innocent child to the present moment? Is it your personality changes from when you were five years old to when you're 30 or 40? You know, is it, you know, just how quickly the personality can change according to the conditions of the present moment. So can, one can love somebody and then hate them the next moment just through the conditions changing. So the emotional state is very unstable, and we, but we take it personally. We identify with our feelings or with our ideals. So there's clinging to things that are basically unstable. Their very nature is unstable. Your body is an unstable thing to identify with. Your emotions are very unstable. It's subject to all kinds of external conditions changing. Your intellect, you know, what is that? You know, the, just people are so attached to being reasonable, using intellectual reason, logic, which is a, a kind of development of thinking, controlled thinking, uh, using right and wrong and true and false, good and bad. But is that stable? Can you mean you can you lose your intellect? The intellect is, you know, the, to try to make life completely rational and sensible and fair is hopeless because we have to live with what is, you know, inexorably changing and we can't stop that change. We can't cling to an ideal and expect to... Uh, make it permanent, they change. And some of the biggest cynics in modern society were once very idealistic. In religion, we can become very cynical because we, you know, we practice meditation, we become monks or nuns or samanas, and we, we give our life to this very noble tradition, and then we we aren't getting what we want as a person. So people lose faith, lose, become cynics, become, you know, they say, I've meditated, but I didn't get anything out of it. And so it's if you're meditating in order to get something, you can be the witness of that. If you're trying to get samadhi or concentrated, you can witness that. What is it that is aware of, I want samadhi? Is it, you know, you take it personally, but it's a desire to get something you don't have or you imagine. to get enlightened. We practice to realize Nibbana in the Upasambara, in the ordination ceremonies, to realize Nibbana for ourselves. What does that mean? Can, can, can I, as a person, realize Nibbana? And so, of course, 
you know, as a, as a person, I certainly wanted Nibbana, wanted Samadhi, wanted Jhana, wanted enlightenment. They're all desirable words, concepts. But then the Buddha points to the, the ego, the Sakyaditi ego, the personality, the, the sense of oneself as a physical form, as a man or woman, and all our identities are acquired identities. But what we share without identifying with anything is consciousness. Whether you're male or female, or black or white, or Buddhist or Muslim or Christian, consciousness is not a creation that you get through culture, through conditioning. In fact, there'd be no way you could exist if there was no consciousness. So just investigating experience, just realizing when you were five years old, you were aware, you were experiencing life. As a, as a five-year-old child experiences under the conditions you were living in at the time, you were receiving information from your mother and father, from your brothers and sisters, from the society about right and wrong. You form an identity of yourself through your relationships with your mother and father and, and peers and society. You form, your, you know, we, we get all kinds of information about whether we're good or bad, right or wrong, through, through uh, our parents, through our society, through our education. We're trained to be moral, keep the Ten Commandments if you're a Christian, or the Five Precepts. These are about mor morality, about action and speech. And this is all taken very personally. So a bad action, you you become a bad person. Through telling a lie, you be, you you become a liar. By stealing something, you become a thief. And that's how the, the, the identification operates. When you ordain as a bhikkhu, you become a bhikkhu. Take it, ordaining a siladhar, you become a siladhar. So this is an identity. But what is the ultimate reality behind all these identities is Conscious awareness, Dhamma, is the refuge. So investigate that, you know, just, to, you know, really when you were five years old, you, you were a conscious form but you didn't have all the knowledge that you can have when you're older. You're innocent. So you believe what you're told. You kind of know that your mother is, is like God or your father is, is a God. You know, they're the ones we depend on for a sense of safety. So then, and then as we grow older, we become to realize they're not really gods. They made all kinds of errors and have problems, and and then we, you know, we lose that sense of seeing our parents through through an innocent mind into a critical mind. We become critical. We become aware of the flaws that we experience through our family, through our education. But I found it very helpful to really, and when I was five years old, 
there is still this consciousness hasn't changed. As a fully conscious human form at five, and when I was born, and now that I'm old, the consciousness doesn't get old. You know, consciousness doesn't have an age, but the body certainly ages. And then you've, you've had all these years, nearly 90 years of experience through the senses. So you have memories, a lot of memories through just because these forms you can remember what they of the things of the past, the experience of the past, which can create a sense of of joy or depression or despair. Just through remembering unfortunate incidents in your past or failures you've made or mistakes you've made in the past. Another subject to really investigate is guilt. This is a very common problem in, in the Western world. Because the Judeo-Christian uh, tend to see that we're, we're basically sinners. So you get this in this kind of information that our very nature is sinful from the day you're born, born in sin. And you've got to try to behave yourself, be rewarded by being virtuous. So then we are not always successful in being virtuous, or we even rebel against it. We can deliberately become unvirtuous just through rebellious tendencies. But the consciousness doesn't change to the rebel or a faith-oriented individual. You know, consciousness in, in King Charles and consciousness in each one of us is the same. It's not, it's not a king, it's not a, a Buddhist monk. It's not a, a, a man or a woman, but it's here and now in this watch. What you experience, what you don't experience consciousness, you are the consciousness. itself, that's your true nature. And when you find that out, when you realize that, it's not a matter of faith and belief anymore, because the Buddhist teachings are pointing the way to realize this for yourself. Ben Bajitang, Bajitang way to eat Benuhi, which is, which is to realize this for yourself, to know directly Dhamma is here and now, apparent here and now, timeless. So this, in the Theravada school, it's always about, you know, and the whole purpose is to investigate. You're given a freedom, encouragement to investigate experience. Is there a permanent experience? You know, you can remember maybe remember when you were five years old. But a memory is very unsubstantial, unstable thing. People lose their memories. Acquired knowledge, great intellects who have spent their life studying science and psychology can get dementia and Alzheimer's, can lose all their, what they've learned over all the years of their life, just through the uh, something, what is the cause and limitations of that. But it's, so memory is not something to, to hold on to, nor is an ideal about the future. It will, 
will you be reborn again? Is uh, if you've been a good monk or nun, a good samana, will you be reborn in a in a heavenly realm? You know, we can speculate. Is there a heaven or hell? Is there, will we go to hell if we've committed crimes? And uh, will we go to heaven or will we go to an is Nibbana a state that we go to as a person? You know, we can think of, I hope I go to Nibbana, which is just a, you know, a way of thinking, and it has no reality in, the, in even the scriptures. So the person, personality, never goes to Nibbana. But what isn't personal, it's already there. So when you begin to realize that for yourself, you're not what you think or believe or Fear is really not what you are. You're not, you know, you see yourself as a frightened person, as a guilty person, as a weak person or a strong person or whatever. These are just images you create and you can cling to, but they'll always fail in the end because the body gets old the, the faculties deteriorate, and that's just the normal way of samsara, of conditioned phenomena. It begins, grows up, gets old, and dies, and that's, that's the way of all conditions. They're impermanent and unstable and unsatisfactory. So I encourage you to take your stand with awareness and learn from life as you experience it here, whether you, what you like or don't like, agree or disagree with, be the witness to it. Don't get caught up in the scandals or gossip or uh, crises that, that all human beings have in life. But use them, they're going to happen. They're going to be disappointments, losses, shocks, and, and we can become disillusioned. We can become critical of tradition, of Buddhism, of, of uh, monks or nuns, and we, uh, you know, that's how we're conditioned. That's the personality condition to love and hate, like or dislike. But what isn't conditioned is awareness, mindfulness, whatever you want to call it. So I'm here to encourage you to, to trust in this. When I chant, Aparuta de Sangamatasa Taura, that's the gate to the deathless is open. Well, that's a statement that we assume was made by the Buddha after his enlightenment. The gate to the deathless is open. And that was a very, to me, was the most inspiring proclamation. There's a way out of this, this realm of suffering. When you're caught in the in the identity with the five khandhas and their changingness, and you 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 inherit your parents' uh, genes and DNA and so forth, so we we're kind of born into the world. We don't ask to be born. We're born into the families that we're born into, and uh, this is the way it is. Birth is like this. But then we form this sense of being separate. You know, we see our identities, I'm uh, separate. My mother's, my mother's a separate person from me. 
my father is a different person than I am. I'm a different, very different from my brother or sister. And so we, we identify with our differences, with our, you know, we long for love and stability and safety and, and security. But to find it in the world, in samsara, which is, you know, this changing, these changing conditions that we experience through the senses, this is a completely sensitive experience that we're born into. Once you're born, you know, a little baby has to experience through seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, through thinking, through emotion. And that's life in the forms of the human condition. It's not, it's not a blissful experience. It was never intended to be. Why it is this way, I, nobody knows. You can't answer the question, why? Who created it? How did it happen, you know? And in terms of Buddhist psychology, it's basically an illusion. This material realm that we're experiencing is an illusion. But to the eyes, it seems very real. You know, and all our personality, cultural identities have been based on the reality of the five khandhas, of the what we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, think, and feel. And, and just to notice that sensitivity is like this. You know, suddenly you're opening yourself up to not trying to find anything, but to just be here and now. And being a sensitive form is like this. You're experiencing beauty, ugliness, pleasure, pain through the senses, through the form of a human body that you have. And it's like this, being human, having a human body, having a male body is like this. Having a female body is like this. So it's it's not judging which is better or uh, how, you know should everybody be male or female or which is the superior sex. These are opinions formed through cultural identification through conditioning. It's not about superiority and inferiority anymore. It's about all conditions are impermanent and not self. So we learn from experiencing Amarvati in the next month with the three month winter's retreat. Now just that, saying that three month winter, the winter's retreat, how does that affect you? You know, are you looking forward to it or do you dread it or having to, you know, the English winter, stillness, cold, and you know you can you can uh, quietness stillness you know so you can sit here and imagine the winter's retreat and each one of us might have a different emotional reaction of looking forward to it or dreading it but being the witness to looking forward to it it's like this. And the winter retreat dreading it is like this. And you kind of listen and relax and just be, not trying to find anything, but just recognizing the way it is that you're actually experiencing some emotion just by those winter retreat words. And this, you know, this is a way of investigating to find out what is the where. You know, I could tell you you should look forward and really practice hard and dedicate yourself to serious practice. I could, you know, I'll give you all kinds of good advice about how to use the winter's retreat, and 
Or I could say, you know, I could criticize it. But as a senior monk, you know, you're trying to support the winter's retreat, and so I recommend it and encourage you and, and try to inspire you and so forth. But it's really up to you how you use the winter's retreat. So it's, it's always this kind of freedom you realize is your true nature. You're not a bound, incarcerated into a form, a male or female form, or, any, you know, as you might feel sometimes, as we all feel sometimes, being limited and born into this very restricted form that we identify with. But ultimate freedom, enlightenment, is here and now, apparent here and now. And that's what we realize through awareness, through mindfulness, through conscious awareness. And it's not being aware of the object anymore, but of the way it is. So that's the state of being, being aware, rather than becoming aware. So it's more of a sense of letting go, relaxation, listening, observing. It's like this, being bored, being restless is like this. Being angry, being frightened, being greedy is like this. So it's, it's this, this simple statement, it's like this, is a way of using English language to, to remind yourself that experience is always here and now through the senses. This is an experience. What we're having right now is experience through the senses, sitting, listening, is like this. That's experience, but what is an experience is awareness. It's not something that changes according to other conditions. It's where conditioned phenomena can manifest and disappear. So I offer this as a reflection.